The culture of enslavement had once been so glorious that the dominance gained was wishful. How African slaves were bred in the past by white slavers is a sad truth that we are going to explore at this hour. At this historic point in existence, for enslaved people in the pre-Civil War U.S. South, life cycles and reproduction were a daily concern within plantation communities, with many enslavers comparing enslaved people to livestock such as cows, calves, horses, and pigs. It has gotten so bad at this point that slaveholders had begun to think that slavery was grounded in the Bible. This view was inspired in part by an interpretation of the Genesis passage, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Genesis 9. Ham, son of Noah and father of Canaan, was deemed the antediluvian progenitor of the African people. They had begun using the Bible to justify the economic use of slave labor. The subjugation of slaves was taken as a natural right of the white slave owners. The second-class position of the slave was not limited to his relationship with the slave master, but was to be in relation to all whites. Slaves were considered subject to white persons, and then slaveholders would actively coerce their enslaved property to reproduce by cajoling, threatening, and punishing them into intimate relationships. Enslavers then either sold or exploited the children born of these sexual relationships for labor earning themselves some good profit all the way. In this way, enslaved women were both producers and reproducers of slavery, and these children also grew up to unwillingly follow in their parents' footsteps. This was known at the time as slave breeding. In this video today, we are taking a dive into the rarely told detail on how African slaves were bred by white slave owners and what had led to the sad eventuality. Before we continue, don't forget to hit that like button in front of you as a way of encouraging our works. Share with family and friends. Also, keep spreading these eye-openers and do not stop there. Subscribe and keep getting notified for more contents. Join in, building the rising membership of this channel. Now, come along, let us delve into the dark days of slave breeding. From at least the 1770s and 1780s, anti-slavery groups in Britain and North America began coordinating political attacks on international slavery. Initially focused on abolishing the international slave trade, by the turn of the 19th century, anti-slavery activists paid increased attention to sensational claims about slave breeding practices in the Caribbean and mainland North America. The anti-slavery focus on slave breeding intensified in the United States during the 1830s and 1840s, reaching a crescendo in the 1850s as black and white abolitionists deployed sensational and sentimental rhetoric to attack the slave South. This was inevitable, perhaps. Slavery is wrong in every sense, but the American system had grown mighty by relying on it, meaning that those rooted in the act with their quotidian lives in survival, obviously dependent on it, weren't going to back down without a fight. Abolition Abolitionism in the United Kingdom was about the movement in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to end the practice of slavery, whether formal or informal, in the United Kingdom, the British Empire, and the world, including ending the Atlantic slave trade. It was part of a wider abolitionist movement in Western Europe and the Americas. The buying and selling of slaves was made illegal across the British Empire in 1807, but owning slaves overseas was permitted until it was outlawed completely in 1833, beginning a process where from 1834, slaves became indentured apprentices to their former owners until emancipation was achieved for the majority by 1840 and for the remaining exceptions by 1843. The laws that ultimately abolished the Atlantic slave trade came about as a result of the efforts of British abolitionist Christian groups such as the Society of Friends, known as Quakers, and evangelicals led by William Wilberforce, whose efforts through the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade led to the passage of the 1807 Slave Trade Act by the British Parliament in 1807. In addition, some secular thinkers of the Enlightenment had criticized it too for violating the rights of man. James Edward Oglethorpe was the first to act on the Enlightenment case against slavery on humanistic grounds. In his Georgia experiment, he convinced Parliament to ban slavery in his province of Georgia from 1735. The Georgia experiment was the colonial-era policy prohibiting the ownership of slaves in the Georgia colony. At the urging of Georgia's proprietor, 
General James Oglethorpe, and his fellow colonial trustees, the British Parliament formally codified prohibition in 1735, three years after the colony's founding. However, slavery was reinstated in 1751 due to the diminution of the Spanish threat and economic pressure from Georgia's emergent planter class. James Oglethorpe also encouraged his friends, Granville Sharp and Hannah Moore, to pursue the cause vigorously. Soon after his death in 1785, they joined with William Wilberforce and others in forming the Clapham sect. The slave trade had been banned in England in 1802 by the Church Council of London, convened by Anselm. However, the council had no legislative powers unless decreed and signed by the monarch. By 1774, between 10,000 and 15,000 slaves gained freedom in England. The decision did not apply to British overseas territories, for example, the American colonies that had established slavery by positive laws. Somerset's case had become a significant part of the common law of slavery in the English-speaking world, and it helped launch the movement to abolish slavery. The fugitive slave, James Somerset, who had escaped, and his master, Charles Stewart, had him captured and imprisoned on board a ship, intending to ship him to Jamaica to be resold into slavery. While in London, Somerset had been baptized and three godparents issued a writ of habeas corpus. As a result, Lord Mansfield, Chief Justice of the Court of the King's Bench, had to judge whether Somerset's abduction was lawful or not under English common law. The case received national attention and five advocates supported the action on behalf of Somerset, who was in the end discharged. After reading about Somerset's case, Joseph Knight, an enslaved African who had been purchased by his master John Wedderburn in Jamaica and brought to Scotland, left him. Married and with a child, he filed a freedom suit on the grounds that he could not be held as a slave in Great Britain. In the case of Knight v. Wedderburn, 1778, Wedderburn said that Knight owed him perpetual servitude. The Court of Session of Scotland ruled against him, saying that chattel slavery was not recognized under the law of Scotland and slaves could seek court protection to leave a master or avoid being forcibly removed from Scotland to be returned to slavery in the colonies. At this point, the plantocracy had become concerned and got organized, setting up the London Society of West India Planters and Merchants to represent their views. From its inception in 1780, the organization played a major role in resisting the abolition of the slave trade and that of slavery itself. The society brought together three different groups, British sugar merchants, absentee planters, and colonial agents. Anti-slavery sentiment may have grown in the British Isles in the first few years after the Somerset case. In 1774, influenced by the case and by the writings of Quaker abolitionist Anthony Benezet, John Wesley, the leader of the Methodist tendency in the Church of England, published Thoughts Upon Slavery, in which he passionately criticized the practice. In his 1776, a dissertation on the duty of mercy and sin of cruelty to brute animals, the clergyman Humphrey Primat wrote, The white man, notwithstanding the barbarity of custom and prejudice, can have no right, by virtue of his color, to enslave and tyrannize over a black man. In 1781, the Dublin Universal Free Debating Society challenged its members to consider if enslaving the Negro race is justifiable on principles of humanity of policy. Despite the ending of slavery in Great Britain, the West Indian colonies of the British Empire continued to practice it. British banks continued to finance the commodities and shipping industries in the colonies they had earlier established, which still relied heavily upon slavery despite the legal developments in Great Britain. Around 6 million Africans were enslaved and taken to the Americas, at least one-third of them in British ships. It has been estimated that overall, about 12 million Africans were captured to be taken to the Americas in slavery. The developing slave-based industries made Britain rich and prosperous. Until the abolition of slavery, the main source of labor on the numerous plantations belonging to British colonies throughout the Caribbean during the 18th and 19th centuries was enslaved African people. These plantations produced 80 to 90 percent of the sugar consumed in Western Europe. From 1761 to 1807, traders based in British ports hauled 1,428,000 captive African people across the Atlantic and pocketed 60 million pounds, that is, perhaps 8 billion pounds in today's money, from the sale of enslaved people.
In 1713, a consensus between Spain and Britain made Britain monopolize the business of slave trade with the Spanish colonies. Under the Asiento de Negros, Britain was contracted to supply those colonies with about 4,800 slaves from Africans per year for 30 years. The contract for this supply was assigned to the South Sea Company. It was said that British Queen Anne held some 22.5% of the stock of the South Sea Company. This invariably means that the Queen benefited a lot from the business of African enslavement. The Atlantic slave trade, also called Triangle Trade, which included the trafficking in slaves by British merchants who exported manufactured goods from ports such as Bristol and Liverpool, sold or exchanged these for slaves in West Africa, where the African chieftain hierarchy was tied to slavery and shipped the slaves to British colonies and other Caribbean countries or the American colonies. Their traders sold or exchanged the slaves for rum and sugar in the Caribbean and tobacco and rice in the American South, which they took back to British ports. The merchants traded in three places with each round trip. However, it was not until the 18th century that America took over the lead from the Portuguese and the British, making America the most slave breeders. Political influence against the inhumanity of the slave trade would grow strongly in the late 18th century. The Slave Trade Act was passed by the British Parliament on 25 March 1807, making the slave trade illegal throughout the British Empire. It was partly enforced by the West Africa Squadron. The act imposed a fine of 100 pounds for every slave found aboard a British ship. The 1807 Act's intention was to entirely outlaw the slave trade within the British Empire, but the lucrative trade continued through smuggling. Sometimes captains at risk of being caught by the Royal Navy would throw slaves into the sea to reduce their fines. Abolitionist Henry Brogham realized that trading would continue, and so as a new MP successfully introduced the Slave Trade Felony Act, 1811. This law at last made slave trading a criminal felony throughout the empire and for British subjects worldwide. This proved far more effective and ended the trade across the empire as the Royal Navy ruthlessly pursued slave ships. In 1827, Britain defined participation in the slave trade as piracy and punishable by death. This led to increased calls for abolition in America, supported by members of the U.S. Congress from both the North and the South, as well as President Thomas Jefferson. At the same time that the importation of slaves from Africa was being restricted or eliminated, the United States was undergoing a rapid expansion of cotton, sugarcane, and rice production in the Deep South and the West. The invention of the cotton gin enabled the profitable cultivation of short staple cotton, which could be produced more widely than other types. Thus, slavery became crucial to the southern economy, as the demand for slaves increased due to the expansion of cotton production, leading slave owners to breed slaves like animals to maximize profits and labor. Slaves were treated as a commodity by owners and traders alike and were regarded as the crucial labor for the production of lucrative cash crops that fed the triangular trade. While they are managed as chattel assets, obviously similar to farm animals, slave owners passed laws regulating slavery and the slave trade, designed to protect their financial investment. The enslaved workers had no more rights than a cow or a horse, or as famously put by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of Dred Scott v. Sanford, they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. On large plantations, enslaved families were separated for different types of labor. Men tended to be assigned to large field gangs. Workers were assigned to the task for which they were best physically suited in the judgment of the overseer. Breeding in response to end of slave imports. The prohibition on the importation of slaves into the United States after 1808 limited the supply of slaves in the United States. This came at a time when the invention of the cotton gin enabled the expansion of cultivation in the uplands of short staple cotton, leading to clearing lands cultivating cotton through large areas of the Deep South. The demand for labor in the area increased sharply and led to an expansion of the internal slave market. To add to the supply of slaves, slaveholders looked at the fertility of slave women as part of their productivity and intermittently forced the women to have large numbers of children. During this time period, the terms breeders, breeding slaves, child-bearing women, breeding period, and too old to breed became sadly familiar. Although America had banned the import of slaves from Africa and the West Indies, 
the impact on actual slavery in America was almost non-existent. One could reasonably ask, why ban slave imports and not slavery itself? The answer is because, for many of the proponents of the prohibition, including Thomas Jefferson, the reason was not based on humanitarian concerns, but on economics. The South was producing and selling enough slaves internally that the slave trade was reducing prices for slaves and cutting into profits. In 1819, another act was passed, allowing U.S. ships to not only patrol its own shores, but the coast of Africa in an attempt to stop slave ships at the source. Not for concerns about ending slavery, but in protectionism for American slave owners. Everything was contingent on the fact that there was a self-sustaining population of about 4 million slaves in America at the time. Southern legislators joined with Northern ones in passing both the acts that banned the external slave trading, but ignored slavery. Most of us are aware that slave owners often bred their slaves to produce more workers. We are taught almost nothing about the breeding farms whose function was to produce as many slaves as possible for the sale and distribution throughout the South to meet their needs. Two of the largest breeding farms were located in Richmond, VA, and the Maryland Eastern Shore. Enslaved women of prime childbearing age, between 15 to 35 years old, were considered highly valuable by slave traders, especially after the 1807 law prohibiting the import of slaves into the United States. Even the womb of little girls came to represent the expansion of financial assets. Wells Ogogome learned of one eight-year-old girl, Nancy, who was sold on the promise of the future and increase of Nancy. At some point, to combat the high rate of death among slaves, plantation owners demanded females start having children at 13. By 20, the enslaved women would be expected to have about five children. Young women were often advertised for sale as good breeding stock. To encourage childbearing, some population owners promised women slaves their freedom after they had produced 15 children. One slave trader from Virginia boasted that his successful breeding policies enabled him to sell 6,000 slave children a year. Enslaved women struggled with the idea of carrying, birthing, and raising children to only have their children taken away to perpetuate the cruel system that held them captive and inflicted trauma daily. Wells Ogogome discovered one incredibly distraught woman who, after seven of her children were taken from her, called out to the universe, why don't God kill me? Here's a certain chilling narrative told to the Works Progress Administration, WPA, by a certain slave. My master started out with two women slaves and raised 300 slaves, testified John Smith, a 108-year-old former slave who was interviewed by a WPA employee in the late 1930s. Smith's testimony was as sensational as it was disturbing. He recalled that short Peggy and long Peggy the two women his master started out with were prized for their reproductive power. The sexual exploitation that Smith claimed these women experienced led to the reproduction of slaves who enriched Smith's master through their labor or sale. An enslaved woman was a sex tool beneath the level of moral considerations. She was an economic good, useful, in addition to her menial labor for breeding more slaves. To attain that purpose, the master mated her promiscuously according to his breeding plans. The master, his sons and other members of his family, took turns with her to increase the family's fortune and to satisfy his extramarital sexual desires. Guests and neighbors were also invited to this luxury. In this world, black women ain't nothing but breeders. To have children foodie white folks to sell down river like they do horses and cows. With these melancholic words, Mammy, a key actor in Randolph Edmonds' dialect drama Breeders, 1930s, exposed one of the deepest historical wounds in the collective memory of early 20th century black Americans, the violent sexual exploitation of African American women during this era. Edmonds used the trope of slave breeding to frame his protest against the racism and violence that white Americans directed against black people. Planters in the Upper South states started selling slaves to the Deep South generally through slave traders such as Franklin and Armfield, a historic commercial building in Alexandria, Virginia, built some time ago between 1810 to 1820 before being converted later on to the offices of the largest slave trading firm in the United States in 1828 by Isaac Franklin and John Armfield. In addition, Louisville, Kentucky, 
on the Ohio River was a major slave market and port for shipping slaves downriver by the Mississippi to the south. New Orleans had the largest slave market in the country and became the fourth largest city in the U.S. by 1840 and the wealthiest, mostly because of its slave trade and associated businesses. In the antebellum years, numerous escaped slaves wrote about their experiences in books called Slave Narratives. Many recounted that at least a portion of slave owners continuously interfered in the sexual lives of their slaves, usually the women. The slave narratives also testified that slave women were subjected to rape, arranged marriages, forced matings, sexual violation by masters, their sons or overseers, and other forms of abuse. The historian E. Franklin Frazier, in his book The Negro Family, stated that there were masters who, without any regard for the preferences of their slaves, mated their human chattel as they did their stock. Ex-slave Maggie Stenhouse remarked, During slavery, there were stockmen. They was weighed and tested. A man would rent the stockman and put him in a room with some young women he wanted to raise children from. It was this outrageous! Some experts suggest that there may have been several factors that coalesced to make the breeding of slaves a common practice by the end of the 18th century. Chief among them, the enactment of laws and practices that transformed the view of slaves from personhood into thinghood. In this way, however, slaves could be bought and sold as chattel without presenting a challenge to the religious beliefs and social mores of the society at large. All rights were to the owner of the slave, with the slave having no rights of self-determination either to their own person, spouse, or children. Harriet Jacobs, in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by her own hand, 1861, shows us a clue into what was with this narrative. When my babe was born, they said it was premature. It weighed only four pounds, but God let it live. I heard the doctor say I could not survive till morning. I had often prayed for death, but now I did not want to die, unless my child could die too. Many weeks passed before I was able to leave my bed. I was a mere wreck of my former self. For a year, there was scarcely a day when I was free from chills and fever. My babe also was sickly. His little limbs were often racked with pain. Dr. Flint continued his visits to look after my health, and he did not fail to remind me that my child was an addition to his stock of slaves. This insight from Harriet Jacobs' narrative demonstrates the different motivations enslaved parents and enslavers had for the survival and health of children. While Harriet worried for the well-being of her premature baby, praying for his recovery and growth, Dr. Flint, whose actual real name was Dr. James Norcom, saw Harriet's baby not as a sick infant, but an addition to his stock of slaves. Harriet later wrote that her children grew finely and that Norcom often remarked to her with an exulting smile, These brats will bring me a handsome sum of money one of these days. Enslavers shrewdly calculated the life of enslaved children. As they grew older, they grew more valuable, and enslaved boys and men were valued higher at market than girls and women. However, the commodification and marketization of breeding women enslaved women either at the prime of their fertile lives or who had already proven to birth multiple children were a more complicated story. Some enslavers preferred to avoid purchasing particularly fertile women as they could not labor as productively in the fields due to their pregnant state and were reduced to what was known as a half hand rather than a full hand. Others, however, saw potential in fertile women and valued women that produced lots of children as they were reproducing the workforce with their natural increase and thus increasing the number of slaves that could be sold or exploited through labor. Thus, the value of these breeding women at auction varied depending on whether enslavers viewed these women as the creator of potential lives and profit. In particular, slaveholding women saw value in these breeding women and financially savvy white women purchased them with the intent to exploit their future increase. The children born of relationships forced by slaveholders were kept under the watchful eye of their enslavers, and white men and women often took them away from their parents and into the big house to utilize them as domestic servants and keep a close eye on them. Many enslavers also carried out a feeding regime by forcing the children to eat from long troughs, not unlike those they used to feed livestock. In this way, enslavers systematically controlled what and when children ate 
Slaveholding women also gave the children medicine, such as Jerusalem oak, to cure parasites like worms and forced them to run around the plantation and engage in races to see who the fittest was. All of this was to make sure that the children grew up to fit their specifications for the labor they intended them to carry out. Many of these enslaved girls and boys were singled out as potentially productive producers and reproducers. Just as their enslavers had forced their parents to reproduce the labor force, they also forced the next generation to do so too. In a study of 2,588 slaves in 1860 by the economist Richard Such, he found that on slave holdings with at least one woman, the average ratio of women to men exceeded 2.1. The imbalance was greater in the selling states, where the excess of women over men was 300 per thousand. Ned Sublette, co-author of the American Slave Coast, states that the reproductive worth of breeding women was essential to the young country's expansion, not just for labor, but as merchandise and collateral stemming from a shortage of silver, gold, or sound paper tender. He concludes that slaves and their descendants were used as human savings accounts, with newborns serving as interest that functioned as the basis of money and credit in a market premised on the continual expansion of slavery. And why could anybody even think like that? In closing, the breeding of slaves wasn't just about bodies, it was about breaking spirits and erasing identities. The scars of this barbaric practice may run deep, but they cannot erase the unyielding spirit of resistance that continues to inspire us to dismantle systems of oppression. Therefore, let their stories ignite our fight for a future where every human being is equally treated, valued, and cherished. That brings us to the end of this video. Share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. We're always delighted to pick from them. Also, support our works by hitting that like button share with friends and families, and subscribe for more. Thank you for watching.